Well, hello and welcome to Grace Point West, where we exist to lead common people into uncommon life in Jesus. Here's what you're gonna know this week. One of the first things we wanna celebrate this week is Grand March. If you don't know what that is, in response to the foster and adopt needs within our city, often grandparents, they are the ones who are actually raising their grandchildren. And so one of the ways that we can help is with back to school right around the corner is to be able to provide school supplies. And so last week we started that and you guys are already crushing it. And so I just wanna give you thanks for that and let's continue to load those boxes up so grandparents can be able to get the school supplies they need to their kiddos to start the school year right. Grace Pointers, I just wanna remind you that August 15th is the deadline for us to be able to raise the $50,000 that we're looking to do to be able to put our best foot forward. As Bon Jovi says, we're halfway there. We're gonna be living on a prayer. It's gonna be amazing. So make sure you get your contributions in for the 15th of August. You guys, coming up August 5th and 6th is Global Leadership Summit. This is the creme de la creme of leadership conferences, and it's gonna be incredible. This is your chance to gain a bunch of wisdom from authors, from speakers, from thought leaders from all around the world. It's gonna be incredible. Take advantage of the discount code below. You can sign up at gpwest.org slash GLS. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us here at Grace Point West. If you're new here or you feel like you're new, there is a QR code on the seat back right in front of you that you can scan with your phone. There's also a ticket in the seat back that you can fill out, drop in the offering box, or turn it into a friendly face at one of the welcome desks in either of the lobbies. So with that said, now let's prepare our hearts to be able to press into the word that God has for us today as we continue our series, Steadfast, and what it means to live the Psalms. Well, good morning, Grace Point. How y'all feeling this morning? Feeling good? Awesome, awesome. Real quick before we get started, I just wanted to just give honor real quick to uh, Ryan Brown, who, if you were here last week, preached, gave the word, a beautiful message about what it looks like seeing the other side of pain and that there's joy in the morning. It's a beautiful message. So real quick, can we just give some love to Ryan Brown uh, for bringing an awesome word? Godly man, uh, so much to learn from him. Uh, He was, uh, about years back, one of the youth pastors here, and he preceded me, he was before me, and uh, just so grateful for what he's done, even just like, like literally, like creating a path, even just for a gentleman like me to walk through, so, because if you don't know me, I'm Charles, I am the student pastor here at Grace Point West. I love being here. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. That was awesome. (laughs) That, that meant a lot to me, that one shout, that was awesome. Um, so real quick, just wanted to um, just, just give him some love because he's an awesome man of God, godly man. Um, and he started us off with tears last week, if you remember, uh, Inside Out, which I didn't actually see that movie till like this past year. So I'm like super late on that, but it's okay. So, um, but I don't know if it's, it's terrible to say that I didn't cry, so, but I, I did not cry, so I'm just going to be honest. I will, I will share that with you. Uh, yes, a hole in my heart, I understand. So, uh, Real quick, uh, if you're a student in here, 6th grade to 12th grade, just want to let you know we've been doing these events on Sundays called Sunday Fun Days, and uh, what we've been doing is after church, we'll do, we'll hang out, we'll go have some fun. Uh, last week, we, we did a pool party. Uh, this week, this is the last one today, so if you are interested, we are going to go to Casablanca Theaters at 6 o'clock, and we're going to go watch Space Jam 2. Now, I know that you are hesitant on LeBron, and I've heard a lot of that, but I promise you, I mean, I actually, I can't promise you anything, but I, I know he's not better than Michael Jordan. That's all I'm going to say. And folks have been telling that, telling me that, and I'm aware. I'm aware of that. So, but we're going to go see Space Jam 2, $5, bring a friend. It's going to be fun uh, if you are a student here, 6th grade to 12th grade. But with that, super excited to jump in the Word this morning. We have been in a series called Steadfast. And Steadfast is specifically a series as we're going through the book of Psalms. And if you know, if you, you're familiar with the book of Psalms, it's, it's usually the, the book in the Bible that you flip to out of desperation because it's right in the middle, right? So it's like, where do I turn in the Bible this morning? Boom, middle, Psalms. Or it's like 75% Psalms and then the other 25 Proverbs, and it's like, oh, close enough. So like, that's, that's usually what happens when you flip open to this book, Psalms. And, and there's a theme that is woven into this book, Psalms, and it is, it is this spirit of steadfastness, you could say. 
a spirit of being quick to retreat to the place of God. And, and if you know the book of Psalms, David, who wrote them, he was king of Israel. And he, as he was king, he was one that wrote poetry and wrote love songs. And he wrote these things of, of, of remembrance to God of, Lord, I just want to remember you. I want to praise you. I want to give you the glory that you deserve. And this is woven through this whole book of being steadfast, being quick to, to seek grounding in the Lord. And this has just been woven into this book. And so we're going to jump into a different theme this morning. Uh, Super excited to share this. If you have your Bibles with you, flip to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And we are going to read the the full passage. We're going to read it, I think, on the the, the last back end of it. We won't have on the slides, but if you have your Bibles with you, we'll read the, the last bit there. So Psalm 34. NLT, I'm in the NLT translation this morning. So Psalm 34, starting at verse one. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord and let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all of my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy, and no shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all of my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard, and he surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all that they need. Because even the strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. And search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to the cries for help, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. That's a word, come on. You'll get it in a moment, don't worry. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. And he rescues them from all of their troubles. And the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. In the last four verses here, if you read along. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, but not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely overtake the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be punished, but the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come before you, as we read your word and open your word, would it land on our heart? God, we know that this this right here, Lord, is what gives us life in the morning. It's our breath of air. God, even now in this moment, would our hearts be open to you? Any wall that's up, any tension or tenseness in our heart, would you loosen it? Because we want to hear you. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your graciousness and your kindness, which is new and fresh every morning. God, would you reveal that to us this morning in a new way? Lord, we love you. We thank you. And everyone in the room together said, Amen. amen. So... I shared this story with the, the past, with the last service, uh, but I was, I was corrected that it was actually not a story about me, but about one of my siblings. And uh, back when, so I was originally born in, in Lake Tahoe, California, and I just had a gentleman come up to me at the end of, surf, at the end of service, and he was probably 50% kidding, but he said, I didn't know anything good came from California. And, and I will say, I probably would agree with that. <laughs> Anyways, we're not going to go into that because I don't want to offend the Californians in this room who have moved here. Um, but I'm from there, so I can say it. Uh, so 
Back when, uh, w- when I was living there with my family and we were being raised, there is a, there's, there's, and if you have kids, you know this, that there is this internal desire within children to, to wander, right? They have this burning desire to be independent and to, to frolic and do as they please, right? As when they, there's this, there's this certain, certain threshold that they cross where they just start to wander and do things. And, and back, in, back in Lake Tahoe when I was living there, uh, my parents shared the story with me about how one of my siblings, one of my sisters, they, they, were, they were going through the grocery store at Safeway, and they were, they were walking around my mother grabbing the items that she needs and, and doing her grocery shopping. And then she, she, you know, she looks down, you know, daughter's there just looking all happy, and you know, because my older sister, she's like the perfect child, right? So like she's there looking happy, and, and then looks and grabs, you know, the, the milk, right? She grabs the milk and then looks down, and then she's gone, right? How many of you had the experience? Maybe you've seen your kid do that. And they're gone. Thank you. Okay, so, so and they're gone. And what begins now is a, is a 30 minute frolic and search for my sibling who cannot seem to be found in this safe way. And so my parents doing, and my mom doing the right thing, decide, okay, we gotta, we gotta shut the store down. So she goes to the Safeway, the dude who's running the, the Safeway joint, he's, and they say, hey, we need to shut this down. And so, so they shut it down, they close the doors, no one can leave, okay? So no one, everyone's locked inside, like, waiting to get out. They have their groceries, and they're like, hey, my ice cream's gonna melt, I gotta get out of here. So, like, they're trying to get out, the doors are locked. Eventually, employees are, are searching all around the store, trying to find my sibling, trying to looking under everywhere. Eventually, my sibling is found, my my older sister is found under the table at the at the um, veg, the, veg, the the fruit aisle, and she is actually eating an apple under the apple stand, just chewing on it and just enjoying having a good time, and that right there is just is just a a very specific moment where my mom realized I gotta I gotta keep an eye out, like keep a good eye out on my kids now before they start running around and then stealing stuff and you know eating it, and so. This is what my parents learned, and this is what some of you have learned, even about your kids. And maybe you've grown up, and you're like, man, mom, thank you, or thank you, dad, for like putting up with me, or my, my escapade, and my craziness. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because, as you may know, inside each one of us, there comes a point where we have this desire and this drive to be independent. We have this desire and this eagerness to go out and seek and to do things with our life. And there's, there's a moment where we have dreams and aspirations to strive for something. And, and when we cross this point, we, we, we take on this mentality of I have to pull myself up by my bootstraps and pursue my dream. And we, we take on this mentality of independency, which is good, which is oftentimes as parents, what you are training your kids to do, which is to be independent and to make choices and to discern things for their own. But I think there is a point, a specific instance that we need to to separate. What does it mean to depend on oneself versus making wise decisions as a collective? So for example, right now, what I'm getting at is in our day-to-day life with the Lord, that is so common, even for me, to wake up in the morning and to do my life and to live how I want to, to live without his help, without dependency on him. And what I'm getting to you, what I'm, what I'm wanting to propose to you this morning is that God has called us to dependence on him. He has called us to a certain dependence on his strength to give us the energy and the breath in our lungs every single morning. He has called us to this. And, and this is one of the themes that is like woven through Psalms is, is David, every time he's writing, even him being king and having, and he was, he was, the, he was the guy, okay? He was that guy. He was like, he, he knew what to do. He, he, every morning he, 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 he would slay in giants and he, he was leading out armies and this was David. This is who he was. But for some reason, every time when he would write something, he would go back to this place of, God, I need you. I need to depend on you. I need to cling to you. And this was his posture. So often you see this through the Psalms, and it particularly is standing out in Psalm 34. 
God has called us to absolute dependence on him. And as much as we are eager and desire independence from him, he wants to be involved and to support us in every area of our life. He's called us to lean on to him. He wants to be involved. And so this morning, we're going to go through some simple points, some simple ideas. What does it look like to depend on God, to depend on him? And we need him every single day. And in fact, if we think about it, like the, the same breath that God breathed into Adam from the beginning of time has been carried on generation after generation. And some of you need to hear this, that the same breath that God breathed into Adam is, has carried down into you. And sometimes we need to slow down and remember that God gave us almost in a sense permission to breathe this morning. When we first woke up, he granted us the permission to live. How generous is he? How kind is he to give us this gift of life? And however, I've caught myself sometimes, even in the mornings, when, when I have this breath from God and the same breath that he has breathed into me, I forget to thank him. And I forget to lean into him and trust him. And it's so, it's so common to live without God's help every day. It's so common. It's so common to live without seeking his help every morning. And I sort of wake up and then I just kind of start my day and I kind of start, you know, I get my coffee because I need that to be my energy. And to that, I don't blame you. I understand. Don't drink too much of it though because you'll get those migraines, okay? God has called us to depend on him. The same breath he breathed into you in the mornings when we exhale are we remembering him? Are we depending on him being like, God, I cannot function today without your help. I, I cannot move forward. And sometimes we try to. Sometimes we wake up in the morning, we try to, to, to live my day without his help, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he wants to be the breath. Everything you do, he wants to be the breath that powers you every day. He's called us to absolute dependence on him. What does that look like? What does it mean to depend on the Lord? Because this is the issue at hand. Sometimes we forget God. Sometimes we move on and there's, I have a list. I gotta, I gotta get these, these tasks done today and I have to pursue these. I, I have an agenda and this is what we do. And we're overwhelmed by the first things that we have to do in the morning. But God wants to give you an opportunity to slow down, to slow down and say, this right here can be accomplished as I'm helping you, I'm speaking through you. He wants to give you strength every morning. Daily dependence on God, what does it look like? I'm just gonna highlight three simple points this morning. How do we depend on God as our strength? How do we depend on him? It's so easy for us to take on the American hustle mentality, right? I gotta, I gotta get up in the morning and start grinding. I gotta, get, I gotta put the work in, which there is a time and a place to do excellent things for God, to, do, to, to live a life of excellence, which we are called to do. I'm telling you, he's given us the ability to work hard and to put effort into everything we do, not just work, relationships, with family, with friends, coworkers, everything we do with excellence. Why? Because he deserves it. Everything we can do with excellence, with 100%, not 75 or 80%. He gives us the ability to do everything like 100% of our ability. How cool is that? 100% of our potential is just harvested out of us, and God pulls that out of us. It's so special. So this morning, what does it look like to depend on him? What does it look like to depend on God? We're gonna go through a few verses that are going to support these, just these, this, this general theme of depending on him. The first I'd like to share with you is praise. And it's this, praise him at all times. Praise God at all times. And you'll see this even just 
I mean, throughout the whole book, I mean, it always starts out, I mean, you actually sometimes see a journey of David, you know, just, just the rise, He's, he hits the mountain, and then he hits the valley, and it's, God, you're so good, and then the next one, it's like, God, just, like, take me now, like, I'm ready to go, and so, like, you'll see this journey, but almost in every single chapter in Psalms, there is a form of praise that David resorts to, now, he goes to. And he, he is in a state of remembering God and praising him anyway. Praise him at all times. If you look at verse 1 in Psalm 34, I will praise the Lord at all times and I will constantly speak his praises. Why is this significant? Why is praising God significant? What does that have to do with depending on him? I'll tell you what, ha- what has to do with it. We... In this moment, when we are praising God, when we are fixing our eyes and our gaze to him and saying that you get the glory, what that is actually doing, what we don't even notice, is that it's taking the glory off of ourselves. It's taking the praise off of ourselves. When we live in a mentality of, of being proud of, and there is a place to be proud of what we have done and our accomplishments, but when we take on the heart of praise, it redirects the glory from us to him meaning that he gets all of the credit and we get none of it. And sometimes in our day-to-day life, when we're, when we're doing things, for example, if we're having a conversation with someone about something that we did during the weekend or we put a post on Instagram, there's always, and it's, it's so ingrained into who we are in our culture, but there's always that small grain that was, it was actually a little bit of my glory. That was a little bit for me. That glory was a little bit for my sake. And we have to ask ourselves, in everything we do, in every atmosphere, when we present ourselves to people or converse with people about maybe what we do for a living or, or what we're doing in our life, like, like, is all the glory going to him? Is he getting all the credit? Or are we keeping a peace for us? This is why it's so important to praise him at all times and why dependency on him matters in our day to day. Like redirecting, like it's about him. What I do and who I am is about him. This is so important. We don't praise ourselves for our achievements that we've attained without him. What pride do we carry knowing that we accomplished something without his help? What do we carry? It's nothing special, but it's so special when it's like God and I, partnership together doing something in life. It's so special. He wants to be in partnership with you. I think people miss that. Like he wants to walk alongside you. And he wants like, there's, there's a purpose in which he has placed you here for. And, and some of us are tied down in way to, I think I'm, I, I am what I am wrestling with, but that's not true. It's not the case. He wants to pull these things out of you, purpose. And when you wake up in the morning, you know why you're here, not questioning if you're loved. But you wake up with a sense of, I am loved. And never weighed down by those things. We'll get to that in just a moment. But verse two, if you look in in, uh, chapter 34, verse two, I will boast only in the Lord and let all who are helpless take heart. Remember, praise. It's boasting in, in, in the Lord. It's boasting in the Lord. And there's even, there's even this thing in, in, in um, uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2.9, where Paul says, he literally says, I'm, I'm actually going to boast in my weakness. Some of you have heard that before, boasting in my weakness. And what does that mean? And some of us look at that, and we're confused, and, and then we actually become proud of our, of our weakness, right? And there's that, that misunderstanding. But there, there's a different line to, to, to understand about boasting in weakness. So boasting in weakness isn't celebrating failure, It's not celebrating failure, it's celebrating his victory. It's celebrating his victory in our life. Again, it's redirecting our attention and focus to him, and he gets the glory. Boasting in our weakness is really about boasting in him. It's really about boasting in what he's done through us, which is redeem us, restore us, call us sons and daughters again, meaning that what I once was, living in sin, living in shame, living in these old things that were weighing me down, like he's cut that off and he gets the glory. This is what it means to praise and to boast in him. He's the only one that we need to boast about in our day to day. 
Never our own accomplishments and our own possessions or what we've attained. Never in just what we've attained. There's nothing to be proud of in that. He's so much greater. He's so much more. Boast in the Lord. And the, the bottom part of that says to take heart. Take heart. Let all who are helpless take heart. It's so important. The only way to escape this sense of helplessness and brokenness and this is to focus on him, is to set our gaze onto him. Set our gaze onto him. Because if I tell you to not think of a pink elephant, what are you going to think of? A pink elephant. You just thought of it right now. The same thing with our day-to-day life. If we're going to think about our hopelessness all right, and, and these things that are weighing us down, what are we going to think about? If we're going to think about our sin and how much I've fallen short of the glory of God, what are we always going to think about? That, exactly, that's all we're going to think about. But David is saying if we redirect our gaze to him, take heart. That's how we take heart. If we focus on him and his promises and his victory, what will we become? What he paid for us to be in the first place. That. He paid for us to be free. Not just so we can get to heaven one day, but so that heaven can, can, can come down and happen here. And we can experience freedom now from these things. We have to set our gaze to him again. Set our gaze to him. If we fix our eyes on him, it's no longer about us just trying to get right with God. It's just us setting our gaze on him, focusing on who he is. Let him determine who we are. Don't focus so much on now of how I've fallen short. Because we're aware. If you are fully conscious and aware of that, but we need to reflect and remember who he is. Because it's that that actually transforms us. It's not us trying to transform ourselves. It's him through us. Praise is what leads to breakthrough. Praise. Praise is what leads to it. That's what leads to breakthrough. Second idea I'd like to share with you this morning. First one was praise him at all times. Second, find joy in him alone. Find joy in him alone. What does this mean? Verse five, if you look. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy and no shadow of shame will darken their faces. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy and no shadow of shame will darken their faces. Some of you may or may not know this, but there is a significant and a huge difference between these two words, joy and happiness. Some of you may or may not know this or have heard this before. There is a a vast difference between these two ideas of happiness. Come on. If there's a difference between happiness and joy. Come on, he's finding stuff. Amen. (laughs) If I could turn that off, actually. Okay, I can't. It's fine. He's just, he's responding. I need some response, so he's responding. (laughs) Come on, leave it to Siri. There is a difference between these two, joy and happiness. What is the difference? Listen carefully. Happiness, there's something about it. It's it's a, a temporary reaction caused by circumstances. It's a reaction that in which we res, that we react to but depending on how things are going around us. Essentially, depending on how things are is how I am. And how how with, and there are moments in life There are moments in life where we experience this emotion of happiness and it's amazing and it's so special and it's so significant to even, there are seasons, even Proverbs talks about this, where there are seasons to to, to weep but then there are seasons to be happy. There are times in life for that. But there's a huge difference in which 
we are to root ourselves in what will actually sustain us long term. And happiness is not one to be sustained by. Why? Because it's a temporary reaction based on how this is going. And how many of you know that the things that are going on in my life aren't always 100? Things in my life, my ducks aren't always in a row. Things are a mess a lot. In fact, most of the time, it's a mess. And so what is joy? Joy is, is, is delighting in the Lord always. Is delighting in the Lord always. It's a response to him. It's a response. Get this. Reacting to how things are versus responding to who he is. Responding to who he is. Joy is choosing to delight in him even when things aren't going well. Even when things don't add up. Even when, and, and understand this, joy isn't, isn't this fake like emotion where people are just kind of just smiling everywhere because Paul writes often letters in the New Testament where he's literally in prison. Like he's, like he's, like conditions in the prisons back then probably weren't like as nice as they are today. I mean, it's, it's pretty ugly back there. And, and I, I don't picture Paul writing a letter just like with a smile, like just smiling, like, like it's brutal. So, so Paul is when he says, I'm filled with joy even as I am in prison, he's delighting in the Lord. He's delighting, he says, despite the circumstance. I'm choosing to delight in him because I'm looking at his face and the only thing that I see, see you see troubles and trials and tribulation, but I see his traits. I see, because I'm looking at him. I see love, I see compassion, joy, peace. I see these things of God because my gaze is on him. And that's my source of joy despite how things are going. And this is what we're called to walk in. This is what he's challenging us to walk in. And many Christians even believe that if, if you look to him, and as that passage was saying, you, if you look to him, you'll be radiant with joy. Some folks will think subconsciously that if I look to him, I'll be radiant with happiness. I'll be radiant with happiness. And if I give my life to the Lord, then, then my life circumstances will get better. And things will just be, be better. And things will disappear, troubles will disappear. And this is what is sometimes ingrained in us. And that's what we think happens when we say yes to God, that life sometimes get better. And if you are maybe a long-term Christian in the room, you might know that that is actually most, more often than not, the complete opposite. Life actually gets harder sometimes when we give our, after we give our life to the Lord. And it's going to get challenging. In fact, we're even promised in, in John 16, 33, Jesus literally says, he, he, he sits people down and he says, hey, listen to me. In this world, when you are here, you are going to have trouble. It's going to happen. But listen carefully. Take heart. Take heart. I've overcome. I've overcome the world. He's telling us this. Take heart. Don't be discouraged by this, remember me, look at me, look at me. When we set our gaze to him, that's the only thing that matters. That's what gives us strength every morning. Remember, find joy in him alone. God, some of you may have heard this before, heard me say this before, but God did not promise to remove valleys. He promised to walk with us through them. He promised to walk with us through them. And many of us assume that when I become a Christian, my valleys will disappear and God will remove my valleys. And that is not the case. And I'm here to tell you that is not the case. But what he does promise is to be alongside you through it. That is what he was after the whole time. Do you see how oftentimes we shape the world around us to, to meet our needs, right? To benefit us. But God has something so much more that he wants to do with you. He wants to walk alongside you in partnership through it, through it all, the best parts and the low parts of life. He wants to walk with you through them. He wants to be with you. If you slow down, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, we're told, if you seek me with all of your heart, you're going to find me. You just will. 
Question is, are we seeking him with our heart? All of ourselves. Because when we do, he'll be there. He'll be there. Seek him. You'll find him. And even if it's, it feels like a long and exhausting, I got to sit down and I just read this and it is, I feel like I didn't go anywhere. And my, my quiet time life is, is boring. I, oh, it's, I got to go do things. No, but if we slow down and seek him with all of our heart, he'll be there. You'll find him. You'll find him there. That part, shame will not darken your face when you walk with joy. Here's that, that part in that last passage. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Some of us wake up every morning in shame. We've felt this before. And there's this hindrance of, of what I have done, what I, what I have done in my past, what I've experienced, the mistakes I have made. And there's this, there's this anchor that we feel we wake up with every morning, even after we experience God on, on Sunday or, or go to church, and it's, we, we still wake up the next day like, ah, oh, I still feel shame. I still, I still feel shame. I still feel hindered with the weight on my back. I'm telling you this morning, when you look to him, when you look to him, you'll be radiant with joy not darkened by shame. Because again, again, God did not, and Jesus did not just come so that you can have eternal life just one day. And we have to wait. But now in this moment, he says, right now, freedom for you. Freedom for you. I mean, ever heard that? Gone, gone with the old and on with the new. He's talking about now. He's talking about today, freedom now, I meaning cutting off how we once were, the shame, the guilt, the condemnation that we were once feeling because of the mistakes that we made. And he said, no more of that, son. No more of that, daughter. It's time to cut that off. And you put on the new, and you put on the new body, and you put on the new, remember, remember, you don't, you don't put, and this is an analogy that is used in scripture, you don't put old you don't put new wine in old wineskin, meaning that back then when they, when they held wine, like they would hold it in a, in a skin, an actual skin. And if you put new wine in old skin, it causes the wine to be bad. The wine will go bad. But if you put new wine in a new wine skin, it keeps it refreshed. And so that right, therefore symbolizes that we become a new creation. We become a new person to house his presence. We become a new creation to house his traits. The traits of God want to land on you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things. Against such things, there's no law. Those things God wants to place in you and become. And transformation is required. And that happens when we're with, when we're with him. It happens when we're with him. Verse 8, if you look, taste and see that the Lord is good over the joys of those who take refuge in him. Taste and see. This is the only way you'll know what joy is like. This is the only way you'll know. And many of us, in regards to looking at what this Bible or what this Jesus is all about, who this Jesus is, Many of us have heard of it and maybe observed it from the outside, from the outside looking in. And maybe we've had a really rough experience with church. And I was raised in this church, and there was a lot of a, a heartbreak that took place and a lot of pain I came from and the way that the church treated me at once upon a time. And to that, I understand. And whatever happened, I'm sorry. And those things... I understand. I want to challenge you in this moment. Even if we've heard and observed the things about Jesus, is he really love? Is he really freedom? Is he really going to set me free and cut off the old and I can become the new? The only way is for you to taste and see for yourself. So when you meet him in the, in the place when no one's watching, 
maybe we've heard and observed from the outside looking in. Maybe I'll become a better person if I keep going to church. If I keep just showing up, then I will just kind of become a better person. And we observe and kind of hear, and, and we're doing the right thing, right? But I'm telling you, transformation lands and takes place when we retreat and we're with him. When we slow down and remember him. This is where it, where it takes place. You yourself, taste and see. And some of us are opening our Bibles and we're, I have no idea where, to, and it, sometimes it's gonna start out like this. Well, where do I go? Okay, flip to the middle. Oh, Psalm. Okay, well, there you go. That's a good place to start. So this is where it starts. Even if we're reading it and gosh, I don't understand. Taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. But no one's watching. I encourage you to press into that. The final point here. First, praise him at all times. Second, find joy in him alone. Thirdly, acknowledge need. Acknowledge need. If you look at verse 10, even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Even the lions who are the king of the jungle. And some of us have been kind of ingrained, that's been, that idea has been ingrained into especially American culture, which is I need to be the, the, the meanest and baddest lion in the jungle. I need, to, I need to get out there and fight and go hustle and get it done, right? This is, this is the mentality. But here, David's remembering, he's like, hey, even the lions, they'll go hungry. Even those searching for satisfaction and desire, they'll go hungry. Why? Do you remember in the, in the Old Testament when, when, when the, 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 they're set free, the slaves are set free and they're, they're on their way to the promised land and Moses leading them and they're out in the middle of nowhere. Like literally they are, it's desert. If you've ever seen Middle East, it's, there's there, nothing. There's literally nothing out there. It's, it's desert, okay? There's no, there's no in and out. There's no any of that. Like nothing. I don't know why you use in and out. Horrible horrible place to pick. I'm sorry if I offended you. It's true. So like, they're out there. Where, where is the food? God, feed us. And so they reach out to God and they say, Lord, feed us. And what does God promise? Manna. And it's this stuff. And it literally falls from the sky and they're provided with food. But listen carefully to what he says and what he instructs them. He says, this manna will not last you tomorrow. If you try to keep it, if you try to take this manna and save it for tomorrow, it's going to go bad and it's not going to taste good. And some of the people did so. And, and it was not good. And why did God do this? Why did God say, this is your manna? Because it required the people to depend on him for their food every day. It required him. And some of us are living on the manna from last Sunday. Some of us are living from the manna maybe years ago. Maybe some of us are living from the manna of just a few days ago, and this is what we're doing to sustain us. But God even is telling his people, he says, hey, I want to feed you because even the lions are going to go hungry. Even those who are the fiercest and the meanest and the baddest and who can pull themselves up by the bootstraps and take on their dreams and do what they want in the world, even they need to be fed, and I want to feed you. Seek God daily for strength. Seek him daily. Last week's manna isn't gonna feed you today. It won't. God wants to reveal new things to you every single day. There is a new trait about God to, to understand about him every day, believe it or not. He is a big God. He is an ocean. We only know 5% of the ocean. Did you know that? That's insane. 5%? Have you seen the things at the deep sea those monsters? Dude. <laughs> we know 5% and those things are, anyway. So God is vast. He's huge. There's something to learn about him every day. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. When we acknowledge our need, acknowledge our need for him, what are we recognizing? That we need help. Sometimes freedom happens when we acknowledge, firstly, our need for him. When we say, God, I need you, help me. It's in the nature of a good shepherd to 
to, to bind the wounds of his sheep. But how can a shepherd bind the wounds of his sheep if the sheep can't firstly slow down, sit still, and notice, man, I'm injured. If he's struggling and toiling around, how can the good shepherd help him? Recognize today your need for him. To close this out, verse 18, if you look there. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. He's close to the brokenhearted and to those whose spirits are crushed. Maybe there are some of us this morning who have forgotten to praise God at all times. We've been Christians, and man, I, I've, I've forgotten in the morning to wake up and praise him and give him the credit he deserves. I've been kind of keeping some of it. And my encouragement to you today and my response to you is to boast in the Lord. Boast in him. He's the only thing to be genuinely proud about. He is. That's my encouragement to you today. Some of you are doubtful. Is God really going to fulfill me and sustain me? Is God really going to be someone that I can depend on? Is God really someone that I can put my trust in? And you're really questioning that. And some of us are pretty in pursuit of the desires of this world. And we feel pretty, we're, I, I feel all right. My only encouragement to you today is to taste and see for yourself. Taste and see. The only experiences that some of us may have had with Jesus is heartbreak from the church. And again, to that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My only hope is you give it a chance. Give it a taste. When no one's watching, even at first, if it's hard to understand, keep showing up. And lastly, some of you feel, just as it was saying in verse 18 here, you feel broken brokenhearted and there's a lot of heartache my only encouragement to you in regards to that this morning is to recognize you need help I need your help Lord I need help I want to seek you for help he wants to support you through it would you stand with me We're gonna go into a time of worship right now, and this is our opportunity to respond to him. This is our opportunity to respond to his goodness. Some of you, I haven't spoken with him in a while. I haven't depended on him, and I want to depend on him again. God, I'm gonna lay it down. This is why we raise our hands. It's even a symbol of like letting go or reaching out and saying, Dad, I need you. Give me a hand. This is why we do this. We're gonna go into a time of worship. Before we do, if this is something that you wanna step into and say, man, God, I, I wanna take you seriously and I wanna say yes to you. I don't wanna play games anymore, God. I wanna depend on you again. If that's you this morning and you wanna make that choice, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand as a physical expression even to God of reaching out to him. What's on the inside Something special takes place when it's bubbling over onto the outside. So if that's you this morning, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hands. One, two, three. If that's you this morning, would you just lift your hand? Come on. Would you give him some love? Celebrate real quick. Go back to the place of depending on him. He is the one that sustains you. Depend on him as your daily bread. Let's take this time to worship and to press in. You're the refuge in the storm. Faithfulness that stands. Expected for your grace. Goodness that remains. Love redeeming life, the world who tried to blame, awake my soul awake, awake. 
break my heart to see. Oh. Grace Point, go in peace today. We will see you tonight at 6 o'clock for Overflow. 